Our faculty get lots of awards and honors from different organizations, but this is the most important award that a faculty member can receive here from their colleagues at the university. It recognizes their real accomplishments as a member of the faculty, as a, a member of our community here, uh, their accomplishments as a scholar and researcher, as a teacher and in service to the community that we are uh, developing here at Florida State. And it also shows that they're a really good colleague, that they're able to work well with other professors, uh, with administrators, uh, for the greater good of the university. I think Jeff um, embodies essentially all the characteristics that we expect from a Lawton professor. Very broad-based, um, big, big science impact. Not that all these people are scientists, but from a scientific perspective, he certainly at the top of his field. Uh, and but he reaches out to the public and to the larger community. All those aspects I think are important in a Lawton professor. I grew up on the Gulf Coast in Biloxi, Mississippi, and as a kid I was on the water all the time. And then I went to college and I got a major in chemistry at New College down in Sarasota. And I came back to Biloxi and I was visiting one of my high school friends and his mother said to me, well what are you going to do now? And I said, gee, I don't know. And she said, well why don't you go into marine science? And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. And so I owe it all to her. I was asked to talk about my research here at Florida State University. And I've been concerned with greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, both learning about where they come from and also talking to people about the ramifications of the change of the atmosphere by these gases. In the late 70s, scientists started making the first measurements of atmospheric methane and it became apparent that it was increasing rapidly in the atmosphere. And this is a sign of an Earth that's out of balance. Things should not be increasing this fast. It should be a steady state. So I got my PhD in 1985 when this was first realized. NASA made methane its molecule of interest. And so this has been a real boon for me in my career because I was working on methane and it was obviously a serious problem. It was out of balance on the Earth. And, and this slide here, you see that from the year 1000 to present, this is an ice core record, the methane concentration was a steady state. It was always the same, about 600 parts per billion. And now it's over 1800 parts per billion. So it's gone up by a factor of three. And, and, and you can see that this is associated with the Industrial Revolution. So as human beings started to crank things up, the methane concentration in the atmosphere started going crazy, and, and, um, and we really didn't understand why that was happening. And so I worked on wetlands because wetlands are the largest natural source of methane. I've been fortunate to work in the Everglades. I've worked in the Peltander swamps in Virginia, in the boreal peatlands of Minnesota. This is uh, in the Arctic. This is Lapland's Gate in Sweden. And uh, here's another picture of the Arctic. And so all these environments, we've looked at methane, and my colleagues and I found a really strong relationship between net ecosystem production, or primary production, and the methane emitted from those wetlands. And this was really advantageous because you can measure net ecosystem production from space, from satellites, as you, as you see in this slide right here. And so the greenness is related to how much primary production there is. And if you know which areas are wet, then you can predict how much methane is coming from those areas. And so this enabled people to get global estimates of, of wetland methane emission. Peatlands are also a really large source of carbon that's stored in the atmosphere. The amount of carbon that's buried in peats, as you see in this picture, is equivalent to the amount of CO2 in the whole atmosphere. And one of the questions I've been looking at is what's going to happen to that large organic reservoir as the earth changes, as it warms, and as it dries. And this is the spruce experiment in northern Minnesota. It's been in collaboration with the Department of Energy. And we built all these large open top chambers and we're heating the, the peatlands and we're adding additional CO2 to them because of course the CO2 in the atmosphere has gone from 280 parts per million to over 400. And what effects will that have on that large carbon reservoir? So that's one of the projects that I'm involved in. Another project that I'm involved in is permafrost decomposition and we've worked in Canada and in Sweden on this and here you see this landscape this plateau this is a frozen organic carbon bank like kind of like steak in the freezer and as this thaws it collapses and it becomes flooded and it turns from 
a dry storage bank into a wet swamp that we don't know if it's losing carbon, we don't know how much methane it's emitting, and so my research has been aimed at determining the carbon balance when permafrost decomposes and turns into a wetland. And, and here you see this large carbon bank just is disappearing into this wetland. So I've also worked on the effects of the oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon that occurred in 2010. There was a large injection of fossil-free C14 free carbon into the Gulf of Mexico. So it's basically an inverse tracer experiment. And so we followed that carbon through the Gulf. And uh, I've been out on research boats like the Pelican and the Weatherbird at USF. We map the C14 distribution on the sea floor, as you see in this map right here. And the bright spots are where there's a lot of petrocarbon on the sea floor. And we were able to predict, or we were able to offer an estimate of how much oil was deposited on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, which was a mechanism that nobody really had expected to happen. Oil is supposed to float. It isn't supposed to go down to the bottom of the ocean. And yet here it was on the sea floor. And we figured about 10% of the deep water horizon oil ended up down there in the sediments of the deep gulf. You can also follow the fossil carbon into the food web. Here you see catfish, which you always catch. That's whatever I that's what I always catch when I go fishing is a hard-headed catfish. And the ones in Louisiana are the red symbols and they're C14 depleted relative to the ones over in Apalachicola. And that's probably because more petrocarbon is mixing into the, to the, um, the fauna of the Louisiana area relative to the relatively pristine Apalachicola. Uh, I work with my colleague Tarek here on landfills. We've designed better landfill covers to reduce methane emission from landfills to the atmosphere. And uh, one of the things that I've always been really passionate about is communicating the science of the changing earth, the effects that humans have had to the public. And here you see the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere for the past 400,000 years has varied between 180 and 280 parts per million. And it oscillates with climate but it never has been above 280. And accompanying this change in CO2 concentration is a 10 degree, wait, let me say that again, accompanying this 100 part per million CO2 oscillation from 180 to 280 has been an eight degree centigrade temperature change. When the CO2 is low, it's colder. When the CO2 is at 280, when it's high, it's warmer. And now currently you can see that the CO2 concentration is over 400 parts per million. We're halfway back to the concentration of CO2 that occurred in the Pleistocene when there was no ice on the planet whatsoever and the sea level was significantly higher. And so we can expect that there will be climatic change associated with that and, and, that, and that worries me. So I've, I've been out talking to people here in 2014. I was able to meet with a number of other scientists with Governor Rick Scott and I showed him that very graph that I just talked about. I also was able to talk to Charlie Crist in the 2014 campaign. So uh, I try to let people know uh, what's happening on this earth and, and why we need to be concerned about it and change some of our behaviors. I uh, am very active in working with undergraduates and I've, I uh, foster two environmental clubs. This is the Environmental Service Program here you see they've just picked up a bunch of trash out on St. Vincent Island. They're bringing it back to the dock. And um, this is my sea level project, which we saw in the other video. I really appreciate having received the Lawton Award. It will be a boon to my research efforts in the future. But in addition to that, it's been a great thing to receive this from Florida State University. And I plan to give back to Florida State like Florida State has given to me.